So we are, I wanted to continue just having us think about Thanksgiving and being thankful and worship. And the, the thing that really came to my heart was uh, the book of Philippians, where Paul is so thankful for the people that are sharing in the partnership of, uh, you know, in the ministry. And, uh, you know, it's interesting if, if you, uh, um, and I'm going to, I will read the passage from First uh, Philippians 1. So if you turn the book to the book of Philippians with me this morning, hopefully you brought your Bible or have it on your phone or uh, have it on iPad or something, that is great. We don't, you know, purposely we don't have Bibles and the, the people will say, well, we should get some Bibles. The reason we don't do that is we want you to bring your Bibles. That's your sort. Would you go hunting without your rifle? No. Would you go hunting without your pistol? No. Would you go living the Christian life without the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit? No. You need to bring your Bible. And so, uh, and so we encourage you to do that, whether it's electronically or on your phone we don't have them in the pews purposely because we want you to have them. Now, if you don't have a Bible of your own, and sometimes people don't or they lose them or something happens to them, the church will be glad to purchase one for you. In fact, they have a program through the In Faith, which we're affiliated with, where they will actually help pay for people's Bibles. So if you need a Bible, your child needs a Bible, and they're expensive. I know they are. They, sometimes they're $40, 50 sometimes $100 a really nice one, a study Bible. And we'd be glad to help you buy that so that you have a Bible to come to church with and bring your Bible with you. So if you didn't bring your Bible, don't, feel, I don't think I'm trying to scold you. I'm just saying you need, it's great to have your own Bible. And, uh, and sometimes I, I'll, I'll leave my Bible here at church or I'll, you know, I do have a couple other Bibles at home. So I usually dig those out and use them. But, I, you know, it's easy, to, it's easy to misplace it. I understand that. So... But I just want you to know that it's important that you that you that you get into the book, into the Bible for yourself, and you have your own copy, and you can read it at whatever opportunity or time you need to. So we're in, we're, we are in uh, Philippians chapter one, and I just ask you to follow along with me. Uh, So, um, Jeff, could you shut that door, please? Thank you. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, would you, as we read this? I know if you're, and if you're comfortable sitting, that's fine. It's not a big deal. I know Dave has you standing a lot, though, but, but I'd like to, to honor the word this morning. So this is Philippians chapter 1. Philippians is right after Ephesians, right after Romans, I think it is. So Acts and Romans, right after the Gospels. If you're, you know, sometimes it's hard to find these little books. Philippians is a hard one to find. I said, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, <clears throat> to all the saints in, in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way. It is right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending, uh, or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me, and can testify how long for how how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may so that you may be able to discern what is the best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become, a clear, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers of, in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. 
The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of the selfish ambition, not sincerely, supporting that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will be in no way and I, that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to, to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But it is, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you, again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. May God add his blessing to his word. You may be seated. A great passage. He is so thankful for the people that are working with him and the ministry with him. I need to say what a privilege it has been for us to serve here at Happy Home Church. I've never wanted to go to a city or be in a city church. I love the country. I'm a country boy. I love being here. I love being the pastor of this church. We've been the pastor. We've, Jennifer and I have pastored this church for 38 years. So, you know, so it's a, that's been a few years in one place. And we are thankful to God. God is just, you know, one of the weird things that has happened for, uh, you know, years ago, it's, it's really what's happened in, uh, across the board for churches is pastors are staying long, longer. But some denominations, you would, uh, they, would, they would preach it, they'd be at a church for two years, and then they'd move them, you know. Sometimes people would be four or five years, but it's, I think the average now is like four or five years. So we've been here a long time. But we are so thankful. There is nothing that happens here in the church that, you know, people, I mean, people are the ones that make it happen. You know, like I've always said, if you see a, if you see a turtle on top of a fence post, right, you see a turtle on, you know that some, it didn't get there by himself, right? It didn't get up there on, the, on that fence post. Somebody put it up there. And everything that happens here at the church happens because people step up and, you know, whether it's, you know, working on the furnace. You know, we, I was going to turn on the air conditioner for you just so you could experience that this morning, but I thought, well, you probably accept the fact that we did get an air conditioner. Now, you say, no, isn't that pretty weird? Yeah, well, when I thought about it in uh, July, there was none to be had, right? In fact, I've talked to, it's interesting, I've talked to Sharon. Uh, there is, uh, and how many, I can't remember how many ships are out there, and there's like 16, and Jim was telling me how many containers is on are in, on each ship, and there's like 4,500 ships or something out there. And right now there's, I don't know, 100 or 200. And there's like 16,000 containers on each ship. It's just kind of mind-boggling. Well, that's where a lot of our stuff is. So, so uh, when Steve said, you know, we probably should go ahead and work on this because we don't know when we're going to get the air conditioner. And yeah, and they were able to do it. So we're praising the Lord. But next summer, we'll, it will hopefully it will work and we'll be in good shape. So you can see the out, they have a, there's a big air conditioner on the outside if you want to check your look-see at that. Or if you're from that direction, you can see it. 
And they had to lift it up. They had lots of problems. They, they're two young men, really nice guys. They had to crawl underneath the church, which is a daunting task, by the way. I've crawled around underneath there, and I found cat skeletons and other things in there. Uh, that's probably not very appealing, is it, when I talk about that? But it's not much fun. It's, it's really narrow. They got down there, and they, put it, they had to put the air conditioner on the bottom of the furnace. And so they, they had to put it in. So they did some really good work for us. Uh, and it cost you guys about $5,000 to put that air conditioner in. But hopefully, it'll make a difference this summer. We won't use it. We won't use it right now. Right? Anyway, so I just want to say, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. We are so privileged to, to serve here at Happy Home. It's been a great, wonderful place for us. And we're, we're continuing. We're, don't think, oh, pastor's thinking of leaving. No, no thought of that. I'm good. And uh, so we're, we're planning on staying for a while still so just so you know that but we are so uh, we are so thankful for the the partnership that we have with you working here I, i'm so uh, um the elk uh, the elk the elder board and the elk the elder board uh uh you know they do a great job we appreciate that the elders do here their leadership uh so much and uh, along with you know the leadership we have here and appreciate david so much with the music and the, his praise band the praise band up here that sing with him we were blessed for a long time, and you, many of you that, that have been here for a while know that I, I, I led the singing myself, which I don't mind, but it's just, you know, so nice not to have to even worry about the songs, what songs are we going to sing, what are you going to do, you know, so forth and so on. It's all those things are just pressure that, are, that is off of me, and I appreciate, appreciate that so much. So thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. So anyway, so this is, so I just want to say this, so you know, the whole thing about, you know, I am just, uh, I said, you know, my, I titled this, I said, uh, sharing the joy and fellowship in Christ Jesus, because we really do, we share, you know, we share, uh, um, Jesus, uh, Jesus is the key to joy, and we have a, you know, uh, fellowship means uh, that you, you have something in common, and we as believers have that, we have Jesus Christ as our Savior, and, and he is, uh, you know, he is the, the he is the key uh, to, to the joy that's in our heart. We have a relationship, all of the folks who come to Happy Home, because of what Jesus has done. And he is, it really, when you, think about, um, when you think about joy and you think about fellowship, it's all because of Christ. That's our connection with each other. And the life-changing power of the gospel is just amazing. So I said sharing joy and fellowship in Christ Jesus. Paul wrote this letter to Philippi, uh, because uh, he was in chains in Rome. Now, Paul had a, you know, we talked a little bit about that, the shipwreck he went through. He was in Caesarea, Caesarea in Israel for two years, and he, and he appealed to Caesar, you know, so that they had, to, they had to send him, because he was a Roman citizen, they were sending him to Rome. And so now he's in Rome, he's uh, chained to a, uh, to a Roman guard 24 hours a day. Can you imagine what that would be like? I was thinking about that. I, w I wear a CPAP. Do you know what a CPAP is? You know, some of you may not. Some of you probably, a lot of you do. Older, if you're older, it helps you. It helps you. What it does is it opens up your airway so that if you, it, what they found is that you don't get enough oxygen. And so uh, I've had one for how long? 20 years at least. So Jennifer, I would quit breathing at night and she would kick me in bed. She'd kick me to, gen to get me going again, start breathing again. So, so you know, it's uncomfortable because you got this hose that's hooked up to your head, you know. I mean, my hose is six feet long, but you turn over. So it's like, okay. So, I mean, I don't even begin to understand what, but you can imagine being chained to somebody for 24, you know, 24 hours, you know, whether you're sleeping, whatever you're doing, that's what Paul was. The Roman soldiers, would uh, they would take turns six hours at a time. And uh, so, you know, so the chain. So I mean, it's interesting about the chain because, Paul, Paul could looked at the chain and thought about, you know, this, is a, this has been an opportunity for me to share the gospel. Sometimes you feel like you're chained, maybe to your job, maybe you're chained to, you know, maybe you're a young mother and you got 14 kids, you know, and it's like, well, you see two is plenty, but like if you have six or seven or eight, it's, it's more, you know, you're just busy all the time. And so sometimes you feel like you're chained to them, but God can use that. God can use you. You know, I was thinking, I think it was uh, John Wesley's wife had like, or maybe it was John Wesley's mother had 19 kids. I was thinking, wow, that's a lot. Oh, 
busy. Anyway, that's, you know, so, so yeah, so, you know, so it's like, okay, what, what could be, what is your chain today? I, I share this story, I've shared it with most of you, probably have heard this before. So, you know, in the summertime, uh, for many years I worked, um, I'm not, I'm no longer doing this, but I, I would go pick litter on the highway. I had a crew that worked out of uh, Chewila and also out of North Spokane, and, we, and for a couple months out of the summer, and they were high school students. In fact, I've had many, uh, Cole, was, uh, Cole was on my group one year, and uh, others, the Elstons and others were uh, served, uh, worked with me, and I had, so I'd have six kids, and we'd, I would put them out on the highway, and they would pick litter. And so you'd find interesting thing. We, uh, one, one day we found like three Leathermen, you know, those little, those, these tools. And so the kids, if they found some tool, they could keep it. They just had to ask me. You know, so if they found something nice, if they found like a butcher knife or some, I don't know, you should be taking that home, you know. But so they would, they would ask me. So one of my kids found a pair of handcuffs. Uh, they looked like they'd lost from a de deputy sheriff. And so he wanted to know if he could take it home. And so I said, well, let me think about that. So then we went to lunch, and during the lunchtime, he happened to clamp that handcuff on his hand. I was not a happy camper. Now, I was, when I'm, when I'm running the van, there's only one captain of the Pequot, and it's me. I'm making the decisions. I'm doing this, and that, it's like, I'm driven. It's like, we, we're going to pick so many bags today. So it's like, we're not stopping to pick just because you put that uh, handcuff on one of your hands. So we went out to pick. We still went out to pick. Well, you know what happens with a handcuff. You know, you don't, we didn't have the key, uh, you know, and so it just got tighter. So after the first row or so of picking, we went, I said, oh. So anyway, so I had to drive into, we were out, we were, we were about down by Chewila, and, uh, and so we drove into the police office station there, and they got the handcuffs off. He did not take those handcuffs on that, off that. He did not take those home, by the way. We left them there at the police station. You know, I'm thinking, what? What were you thinking? Anyway, you know, we, you know that's about my only experience with, with handcuffs or chains, but I'm thinking, well, you know, you don't want to, yeah. We can, we can sympathize with Paul. I don't think we have an, any understanding of what happened to him. I said that Paul was very thankful. This is point one. Let me just talk a little bit about Paul. Paul was very thankful for his partners in ministry. He appreciated their support and encouragement and was very thankful for the fellowship he shared with them. I mean, you read this passage and it's just, I, you know, I thank my God every time I remember you. That's how he starts out the, the word. Now, some of the, some of the epistles, he was, very, he was unhappy with the churches because of different things. But Philippi and the Philippian church, he pretty much just had praise to say to them. They had issues. A couple of the people in the church were having arguments in the chapter 4. But overall, it was a pretty amazing thing. Paul is rejoicing. And I just want to encourage you. That's what this time of the year should be, an opportunity for us to rejoice. The secret of his joy in this is, is the single mind. He lives for Christ and the gospel. Christ is named 18 times in the first chapter of Philippians. And the gospel is mentioned six times. Isn't that interesting? He says in verse 1, verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's a bold statement. This is his testimony. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I wish I could tell you that I feel that way every day, but I don't. You know, to, for me to live is Christ. I and mean, there's times I feel that way, but there's lots of times I'm self-centered and uh, just, that's not me. I'm just, I, I'm stuck on something else. I'm not, he, that Christ isn't my center. Now, he's still part of my life, but he's not my center. I just think, what a powerful statement. What a, what a great goal for us as believers, that Christ would be the center of our life, that he would be on the throne of our heart, and that our purpose in life is to live for Jesus, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and, and just amazing that, he, that he, he can honestly say that. I'm just I'm amazed at that, that, that. And he's just being sincere and open about it. I talked about fellowship. The word fellowship simply means to have in common. Unless a person trusted Christ as a Savior, he knows nothing of the fellowship of the gospel. And all I mean by that is, you know, have you received Jesus? You know, has Jesus... Has, have you asked Jesus, and we talk about this, have you asked Jesus into your heart? Do you believe in what Jesus did for you on the cross? When you accept that fact, when you accept Jesus Christ, 
That's the redeeming thing that happens. You identify with what Christ Jesus did for you, and now you belong to a family that is worldwide. You can go to Laos. You can go to Africa. You can go wherever, and there are believers because Jesus is working actively in their heart. And that's really the key for us here at Happy Home. The reason this church has existed and has been here since 1903, not this building, that was in 1916, but they built this building, is because there's believers that receive Jesus and they're living for, they live for Jesus. And uh, I wasn't here back in 1906. I know I look like it sometimes. Sometimes I feel like it, but I wasn't here. I'm just saying that it's an amazing thing when you find Jesus Christ. And it would be a terrible thing if you came to this church one time or ten times and you still didn't understand that Jesus loves you and that you need to respond to Jesus. But that's the, that's the fellowship. That's the common bond between all of us, you know. And we have, you know, this last year has been, a, this last couple of years with the COVID has been a straining thing on the church because we had so many disagreements about what we think and how we think. But the bottom line is, Jesus loves us and we all belong to him. We're part of that family of faith worldwide. Clear across the, clear across the world. So keep that in mind. So anyway, he is, he's just, Paul is, is, uh, Focusing in on this, Paul uses three thoughts in the Philippians that describe true Christian fellowship. This is A2. I have, I have you in my mind. I love that. I have you in my mind. I have you in my heart. I have you in my prayers. And that's, you know, Warren Wiersbe, just, he zeroes in on Philippians. He does a great job in the book of Philippians. But it's really true, right? I'm thinking about you. I'm, you know, there's people, I'll be driving down the road, and I'll drive past somebody's house, and, I'm, and, I, and that person I know, maybe, they, maybe they're not coming now, but they used to, and I pray for them, and I think about them, and I think about you, and probably God brings people to, mind, to my heart, and I pray for you. You know, you're, you're in our mind, you're in my mind, you're in my, in my heart, and that's the way we are with each other. You know, maybe you see somebody, I saw, uh, I saw Asia at the store with, with baby Mason, and uh, what a great thing. I ran into Carol Moser. And we talk, you know, it's just great, great experience. You're in our minds, you're in our hearts. That's what Paul is saying here. And then he says, I have you in, in my prayers. And I just love this. He says, this is my, this, this is my relationship with you. I said, Paul, Paul rejoiced in spite of the circumstances. It made no difference what happened to him. He's chained to a Roman soldier just as long as Christ is glorified and the gospel is shared with others. That's his motivating thing. I'm chained, but I'm, but you know, the, the gospel is not. And you know, and so he was concerned about, you know, just as long as Christ is lifted up and Christ is glorified. He says, he to, I just read it to you. He says, they know that I'm in these chains because of Jesus Christ. And uh, he was sharing it with people. I said, look at, uh, and I'm, let me just, I, I need to, I don't want to read the whole passage to you, but look at Acts 16. Uh, in Philippi. Now, see, so he has great memories of these people, but it was a pretty, uh, uh, pretty big thing, you know. That uh, you know, he goes and finds. So I'm just going to start with. Uh, uh, this is I'm going to start this. I'm in Acts chapter 16, verse 16, right? So this is where Paul and Silas get in trouble. Now they're they, they've talked to Lydia. Uh, Lydia, obviously, they've been down with uh, sharing with her different things. Philippi was, by the way, one of the largest cities in Macedonia. I think it was the largest city, a uh, big place. Uh, it was a, like a little miniature Rome kind of thing. It says this is so. Look at if you if you're reading from the scriptures, look at uh, verse 16, Acts 16:16. 16, 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners for, for by fortune telling. This girl, this girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are the servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Isn't that interesting? You know, here she, you know, that you want to have somebody do preach for you. This is this person going around. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. 
And when the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. And the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. And after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. You get the picture, right? You with me? They weren't having a good time. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and other prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prison were shaken, and at once all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison door open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. And the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? How do you even know how to ask that question? Because I think Paul was witnessing to him, right? Witnessing as wherever they were, they heard about it. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. And at that hour of night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. And then immediately he and his family were baptized. And the jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. What a great story, right? But it wasn't much fun for Paul and Silas, right? They got beat up. <clears throat> I said this is, this is B1. Read what happened to Paul and Silas in Acts 16. He and Silas were illegally arrested and beaten, were placed in stocks, were humiliated before the people, but it was through their suffering that the jailer found Jesus Christ. He's rejoicing. He's saying, you know, I'm thinking, he's saying, I, I remember my, my memories of Philippi were great, you know. Oh, they beat me. They, you know, they, they, you know, they stripped me and beat me and they put me in stocks. But they praised the Lord. Isn't it amazing? They sang hymns. They praised the Lord even though they were in the jail. It says the other prisoners were listening to them. And then, of course, God broke everybody free. And the jailer came to know Jesus. Sometimes you have to suffer for the gospel. That's what Paul is saying. And he looked back and, and his memories were great. He says, oh, I love you people of Philippi. Your partners in ministry. Now they believe that he, they, they send him offerings. And of course in chapter 2, Epaphroditus comes and, and ministers to Paul. They send Epaphroditus to come from the church to help him. Isn't that, isn't that cool? They, 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 he knew that they loved him too, and they, were, they appreciated him. This is a good question. I said, we need to ask ourselves the question, am I the kind of Christian who brings joy to other people when they think about us? Am I the kind of Christian who brings joy to other people when they think about us? Or they, when somebody sees you, they, they turn and go the other way, you know? Great question to ask yourself. You bring joy to other people because of what Jesus has done in your heart. The deeper our relationship with Christ and with his people, the greater the joy that awaits us. And the less that joy is dependent on external circumstances. I said there are a number of things that can rob us of joy. This is from Warren Rearsby. He really ties this down really well. He says, one can be the circumstances that surround us. Remember, he was chained. Another can be, this in chapter one, another can be the people in our lives. That was in Philippians 2. Earthly things can become a burden to us. And finally, one of the greatest thieves of joy is worry. Do you have some of these things going on in your life? I, I like to, Jennifer and I have talked about the, the second one a lot. 
that sometimes people can rob us of our joy. You, you, you know, she, she gets a new nightgown or gets a new blouse or something. Look at my new blouse. And my response is, how much does that cost? You know, we don't have that kind of money, right? You rob people of the joy, don't you? Oh, honey, that's beautiful. That really looks good on you. That's your color, right? So there's people in our lives, and sometimes we can steal the joy from other people because of our, the, our attitudes and what we say, right? We steal the joy. Sometimes it's circumstances. I have to be, you know, every day I, when I listen to the news, I get angry about the COVID and how it's being handled. And God says, you know, God says to my heart, hey, that's, that's not your problem. You need to trust me, you know. And so the circumstances, the circumstances that have been in, in our country for the last two and a half years is devastating, but it's like, okay. But Jesus says, hey, don't worry. I've got that. I'll take care of that. You could be chained to a Roman soldier someplace, right? For 24 hours a day. How about the, you know, the other couple of things were things, the things that, you know, things in our life that, you know, and, and I like lots of things, and so, but earthly things, it can be not just material things, but it can be, you know, I, I, you know people that have lots of money, maybe they have two or three places, and now they have to have, I was thinking about this, you know, uh, today was, well, do you think we'll have, like, storage places in heaven to store our stuff, Right? Well, why not? I mean, you know, we have like, what did I figure? Like it was 1.3 acres. You could have a couple storage yet, the thing in the back, but what are you going to do with him? You got everything you could possibly want. You have Jesus. You've got God the Father. You've got, you know, all the, you know, the streets are made of gold, right? And so you have everything that you can possibly imagine. But what would you store, right, in your storage place? But I was just thinking, wow. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, we, 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 you know, the, the stuff that we have, and it's like, okay. It was, uh, Leroy really told me that it was, they started, they didn't have storage bins until 1968, and they started, you know, now you see them everywhere. And I love watching the storage wars, because, you know, I've, I'm with that in the garage sales and all that. I like to watch that. Oh, look what they found. Yeah. How much stuff can you have? Well, my Hobbit house is full. I'd like to add on to it. You can't even walk in it. It's sad. Stuff. Things. Uh, Paul was also talking about things that matter to us, like maybe our reputation or fame or whatever. That sometimes the things that we that are important to us are not the things that we shouldn't do. The last was worry. This steals our. That's a big thief for joy, right? We worry about everything. Anyway, but those are good things to think about. What are the things that are robbing you of your joy today? Think about that. Can be circumstances. Could be money. I mean, money is a big issue for us lots of times. People in our lives. And I said this. Paul wanted to go to Rome as a missionary. This is at the bottom of the page. And a preacher. He was looking for, in fact, that talks about that. I can't wait to get to Rome. But instead, he went to Rome as a prisoner. He was chained to a Roman soldier. And I talked about that 24 hours a day. So, you know, it's interesting. He wanted to go. He wanted to, to uh, be a missionary in Rome and share, and he goes in as a prisoner. You know, you, and you have to think. And so I, I just said, uh, this is back page. God sometimes uses strange tools to help us in advancing the gospel. Paul's chain allowed the gospel to access the whole palace guard. His chain gave Paul contact with the lost. Paul could witness to four different men each day, right? Do you know that the average Christian, after they become a Christian, when they come to Christ, that after two years they have no non-Christian friends? We're supposed to witness to our non-Christian friends, but we don't have any. It's pretty hard to witness to them, isn't it? Right? After two years, we're, because, you know, the tendency, of course, and, we're, and when we're in discipleship, you kind of push them, well, Maybe you're, you're involved in drinking a lot or drugs a lot or something else, and you push away from those people. And, of course, most, most druggies, if you, uh, you know, if, you know, they get really freaked out if you're not doing drugs with them. So in two years, you have no non-Christian friends. Well, Paul had a ready audience, didn't he? Chained to him. 
So they watched him pray. You think about that. Here he was praying for the different churches. You saw his concern for other people, right? That wasn't, it wasn't just, oh, you know, you need, to, you need to turn or burn. Jesus is going to fry you if you don't, you know. No, it wasn't. He was just saying he could, they could see his love for all these churches, these different men that came and were chained to him, right? I like the thought of that, though. His chain gave Paul contact with the lost. Is there something that you're doing in your life that you meet, that you see other uh, non-believers? Sometimes we call them pre-Christians that you can share the message with. It was a great opportunity for Paul. So there was lots of people hearing the gospel that he says that there was, and I don't know if it's in this passage, but it's somewhere. He talks about there's even believers in Caesar's household. Now, does that mean relatives of Caesar? Servants in Caesar's household? I don't know. But the chain allowed him to do that. So like I said earlier, you may, have a, you may be chained. You may feel like you're chained in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation and you can't do anything about it. God may be using that chain in ways that you hadn't imagined. Right? Maybe you're a young mother with kids. Maybe you're, you're in a job that you hate. I don't know but I know that God can use that, right? I, I said that um, even though Paul was, was uh, bound, the gospel was released. Isn't that amazing? He was bound, but the gospel was released. In fact, in, in 2 Timothy, he says this, this is my gospel for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal, but God's word is not chained. That's an amazing thing, right? The power of the gospel that takes people's hearts and, you know, in ways that you wouldn't imagine and changes them because of the power of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. And Paul could say, hey, I know I'm chained, but the gospel message is going out. The praetorian guard is hearing the message. Would he have been able to witness to them just as a Roman soldier or a Roman citizen? No, I don't think so. But because he was chained to them, he could, right? I said, Paul's chain gave courage to the saved. In fact, in Philippians it says, because of my chains, most of the brothers in the, in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. More courageously and fearlessly, right? Well, if Paul, if Paul can witness and he's chained to him, we can certainly witness right? We look at the pastors, and I haven't followed this story up in Canada, but the pastors, because they open up their churches. You know, John MacArthur filed a suit and actually won the suit in California to keep his church open. In fact, now the state of California are paying fines to them because the fines that they leveled, and they're paying him stuff. I don't know all the story about that. You'll have to talk to Ted about that. He's our California expert, by the way, if you want. <laughs> He's shaking his head. Hey, my point of saying is, when John MacArthur stands up and saying, we're not closing our doors, we're not doing what the government says, that gives me courage. Now, you think I, they, we shut, if we open the doors here, don't open the doors here, that's going to ruin our governor in Washington State? I don't think it'll make a big difference. We're just a little, little uh, group of believers here, right? But my point of saying is, it makes us bold. It gives us courage. The pastors that are willing to go to prison... I said, I, I told, we were talking, David and I and Steve, hey, uh, I may end up going to prison. And David said, I'll go with you. And Steve said, I'll go with you. That's good news, right? Because you're not going to go by yourself. But he said the chain. The chain opened the doors for those things. So some of the things that happened to us, and, and, and I have to say this, the COVID are opening doors in places that maybe we wouldn't foresee. There's places that we are reaching out to that maybe we can't reach. We couldn't reach. I don't know. So there, God uses all those things for his glory, for the, for the work of the gospel. So think about, so this is, uh, so my question to you, this is a question, of course, that, was, it, that Paul really kind of raises. What is it that motivates us as a Christian because, you know, he says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. 
And he talks about that. He says, if I die today, it's no big deal. I'm going to be with Jesus. By the way, that's to me, is one of the great uh, facts about, the, you know, say, well, what happens when I die? Well, if you're a believer, you're going to be with Christ. You know, there, there are some groups that believe that, well, you're going to, they're going to put you someplace, you'll be asleep, and then eventually you come. No. If you die today, you know, you're going to be with Jesus. Remember he told the, the thief on the cross, he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. That isn't going to happen down the road. It's going to happen immediately after you pass away. To me, it's a great funeral service, funeral verse. If you're a believer and you know Jesus and you die, you're going to be with him. He says, I don't know what, he says, actually it'd be a lot better to be with Jesus. Now Paul had actually, yeah, at this point, Paul had already been to heaven. They stoned him and they think he died and then he came, they, he came back to life. So he had been in heaven. He saw what was up there. He said, it'd be a lot better to be in heaven to, than to be here. But he says, I'll, I'll, I'll stick around. I'll, I'll help you. That's what he says in this passage, in this first chapter, right? So my question to you is, what, what will you put in there? So put your own word in. Fill in the blanks yourself. I, it's, you could put in there, for me to live is money, and to die is to lose it all. Right? Could be, for me to live is, uh, uh, could be fame, and to, and, uh, and to die is to be forgotten. There's a lot of reality shows. It's amazing. I'm amazed at some of the people that want to be on the shows, and, you know, it's just like, Really? And you know, and it's like, okay, uh, you can have fame for a minute, but it's going to be gone, right? How about power? For to me to live is power, right? Or control. Lots of people want to control other people. I don't know if it's a conscious thought, but they, I like to be in control of the situation. I like to control everything so I can manipulate everything where I want to be. And when I die, that's going to be gone, right? I thought about, you know, a couple of things. I thought, uh, I said, uh, uh, for me to live is, I like to shop. I really do like to shop. I enjoy shopping. And so it's like, okay, but I know I can't take any of it with me, so I, I can pile it up in the Hobbit house, but somebody else is going to have to take care of it, right? I was talking to Anna's mom, Anna, Anna and Adam aren't here today, but uh, Carol um, Van Warmer, who worked for many years for, she's just retired this last year from uh, Deer Park Homelink. Anyway, I was talking to her a couple weeks ago, and she said that she's read this book called The Swedish Death Cleaning. Anybody heard of that? And so it's to get rid of all the stuff so your kids won't have to. So it's, you know, you want to get rid of everything. And, you know, and so they call it The Swedish, and there's actually, she actually wrote a book. The Swedish gal wrote a book about this. So how to get rid of all the stuff so that when you, when you die, your kids won't have to worry about it. Of course, I have, I have some thoughts about that. It's like, I still, have, I still have stuff in my house from my kids living with me and getting married and moving on. In fact, Joy, Joy came back, when my youngest daughter came back and says, just have a garage sale and sell, and sell everything. Yeah, I can do that. That's probably more work than it's worth. But anyway, uh, the idea, so this, what, every year she comes back, she goes and digs through her stuff that's stuck on underneath the stairway. So she finds other stuff that, oh, I had this. See, it's interesting the uh, the uh, if you grew up in the you know and of course I grew up poor on the reservation and uh, it's like everything counts you just don't throw stuff away my my parents never threw anything away you grew up in and during the depression that was just but now that you know this next generation is if if I can't use it this next week I'm gonna toss it so I, so then I'm digging stuff out of the garbage that my daughter threw away now what are you what are you throwing the, the, that scotch tape you can use that I mean I don't understand anyway. So my thinking is, you know, I still got their stuff. They can deal with my stuff when I'm gone. It won't be much fun, but, you know, so I don't know. I'd like to read the book, though, The Swedish Death Cleaning. I'll have to get that. If you run across that, let me know. I'd like to read it. Anyway, <clears throat> what? One more book. Yeah, one more book to put in the Hobbit house. Yeah, so I could say that for me to live is, is book shopping. I mean, I look for, we, we, go, to, we go to Haver. They've got a couple of thrift stores. I go there and look at the books. You'll find stuff in places. I'm sorry. Never mind. <laughs> I said, for me to live is whatever. It's, put, your, put your thoughts in there, you know. And, you know, Paul, Paul said some model for us. Is Christ the center of my life? I'd have to say not all the time. So uh, this is 3A. Paul presented sharing the gospel as a basic source of Christian joy. 
As we reach out to others with the good news of Jesus, we too will discover an overflow of spirit-produced spirit inner joy. I think that's a great thought, right? He's saying you need to share the gospel. And if you do that, if you share the gospel with other people, you will rejoice in that. That will bring joy into your heart. I'll bring joy to your life. That's really the message. He's saying, man, I, you know, I'm chained up, and I, I can see that, they're, that God is working in people's hearts because I'm sharing the gospel message with them. And, and there is joy when we share the, the good news of the gospel. This Thanksgiving season, Christmas time is a great time. People are more open, and you talk about Jesus, and they may not have a clue about Jesus. They know he was born on Christmas that's about all they know. Well, that's a great time to share with them and say, hey, Jesus does love you. Jesus did die for you. He cares for you. What a great time to share uh, the, me the, the message of salvation, the good news. I said, Paul prays for them who have mature Christian love and character. It says, and filled, and I love this. He says, let me read that prayer back to you again. It's just a great prayer. It's not real long. He says, uh, this is in Philippians 1, 9. And this is my prayer, Right? Because he loves these people. He remembers what they did. He's thankful for them. This is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and the depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be, what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. What a great prayer to pray for other people during Thanksgiving, during the, this time of year. Then he says in verse 11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. When God is doing something, we don't, we don't want to take credit for it, but we, we really can't because it's way beyond us. The power of the gospel, the life-changing part of that and what he's doing in people's hearts is amazing. And I, I just love this thought of the, this being filled with the fruit of righteousness. And um, so I, I, this is from Worsby. He says, the fruit tree does not make a great deal of noise when it produces the crop. Right? Have you ever been out in the apple orchard and, oh, the, the apples are growing. I hear them growing, you know, or out in the, you know, the, you know, the banana tree. Oh, the bananas, they're growing. They're, you know, we actually, uh, we have a good friend in California who lives in, um, Kavina, and he has a um, avocado, avocado tree. And he actually came up to visit us, and he brought four or five avocados, really ripe, nice avocados with him. And they wouldn't let him take them on a plane. <laughs> we never got them. But he has a, so it's great. You listen, oh, man, the avocado, I, they're talking to each other. They're, you know, Yeah, no, so my point is, I thought, great, what a great statement. The fruit tree does not make a great deal of noise when it produces its crop. It merely allows the life within to work in a natural way, and the fruit is the result, right? And, and he ends it, he says that, he says that uh, it comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of the Father. The amazing power of the gospel and what it does. And then I said, true spiritual fruit is so beautiful and wonderful that no man can claim credit for it. The glory must be to God alone. He's the one that deserves it. My, my, I, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate all of you so much and the ministry that goes on here at Happy Home. Nothing, we wouldn't get anything done, but you guys step up. I came here uh, yesterday, last night actually, to make sure the heat was on. And, um, and, the, and the, somebody shoveled the, the sidewalk, you know. I mean, that's really nice. Somebody did. I don't know who did it. Somebody did. You know, I come here and <laughs> I come here and, and people are cleaning the church or I come here and people are doing this or that and I'm thinking, yeah, people decorating for Thanksgiving or decorating for Christmas. All those things make things really happen. Teaching our young kids in the back. Being in the nursery. All those are amazing things. All those happen because people, people believe in Jesus. And the love of Jesus has changed their heart and life. And I appreciate that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask today that you write, give us a thankful heart, first of all. Lord, that we are so thankful for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are so, so thankful for, for your work that, uh, that you've been doing here at Happy Home. And Lord, we just pray that you might 
you might remind us of that, that our hearts might be open and filled, and that we might, as Paul could say, I have all these great memories. Even though he suffered while he was there at Philippi, he has great memories of the people that were there, and the people that had come to Christ and loved, and, and, uh, loved Jesus and what the impact they had. And so he was, he was so thankful for that. Lord, we're thankful for that too. Remind us of the people we need to say, hey, thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for your love for the Savior. We just pray that you might give us a thankful heart, Lord, today. Help us to be open, Lord, to your, to your direction. I thank you for, for my brothers and sisters here at Happy Home. And Lord, I thank you for the work that you're doing in Deer Park and, in, uh, and around, this, around North Spokane and the work that you're doing in other churches. We are so thankful for all that. We just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.